Hello everybody. Uh, we are leaving our last unit behind and starting our new unit today on biochemistry. And with that we need to do a brief little introduction uh, to the basics of chemistry, which I hope you remember very, very well from earlier science courses. Um, and so let's get right to it. Okay. Um, chemistry is at the foundation of biology. That is because we are made all biological things just like every other actual thing of our universe is made of, of atoms and molecules. Okay. Um, so chemistry is the foundation of biology. Uh, chemistry leads to those important biomolecules of which our bodies are made, which lead to the cells that make up living things. And remember, please, that um, the cell is the fundamental unit of life. Uh, certainly you can get smaller than a cell, but whatever you get will not be alive. Cells are the fundamental units of living things. Um, but you put a bunch of cells together and then you're going to get uh, tissues, organs, organ systems, organisms, and then all those things that we just talked about in our ecology unit. So um, please remember your basic um, atomic structure. Uh, matter is made up of atoms. Um, and atoms, in turn, you can get even smaller than an atom by uh, going down to the level of the proton, the neutron, and the electron. So please remember uh, all that basic stuff, okay? Uh, remember their locations, protons and neutrons would be in the center and what is called the nucleus of the atom, whereas the electrons are found outside the nucleus. Um, elements are simply pure substances that are made up of only one sort of atom. Uh, so gold is an element made up of only gold atoms. Okay. Um, of course, we remember the periodic table that shows us all of our different types of atoms, different types of elements that exist. Um, there are a few that are of particular importance to living things, and you should know those. Okay. Carbon, uh, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen and phosphorus. Those are the five biggies and if you can remember uh, those five CH I think it's chonops ch chomps. It's almost like chomp but it's not. Uh, you can remember the uh, important the most important elements for life. Most of your body weight by far is made up of those elements. But there are others that are important to life as well. Uh, and you were going to see some of those flash up here. Sulfur, sodium, potassium, magnesium, calcium. And they're not the only ones. Uh, you probably remember that your blood has got iron in it. So that, of course, is going to be important to uh, our, our success as a living thing. So um, there are about 25 elements that are essential for living things, but uh, four of those elements are going to make up 96% of all living matter in our world as we know it. And those four things are carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen. Clearly those are the most important. And then four other elements are going to make up the remaining 4%. And there's your phosphorus, calcium, sulfur, potassium, and so on. Um, now, you need to know the parts of an atom, but as far as we are concerned in biology, what you need to know about are the electrons. Okay, and these are the things in red in this particular diagram, and they are on the outside of the atom. Basically, why we care about those in biology is that these are the parts of the atom that are engaged in chemical reactions. If you have two balls coming together, it is not the center of the ball that is going to react with the other ball. 
it is the outsides of the balls that bump into each other, which is why the electrons are what are going to be engaging in the chemical reactions. So please understand that electrons are on the outside. Remember, they're negatively charged, uh, but they are, they are definitely the parts that are engaging in chemical reactions with other atoms. And in biology, it's all about chemical reactions. We're not really terribly concerned about the nucleus. The nucleus is not engaging in a whole lot in terms of biology. That would be more of physics uh, uh, question. So uh, how reactive and what types of chemical reactions an atom engages in really depend on how many electrons it has not down in here, not on the inside, but on the outermost valence shell, its outermost electron shell, if you might remember that term from chemistry, how many electrons are going to be in this outermost shell. That's going to determine how this atom interacts with other atoms in its neighborhood that it might bump into. So please know this term, valence shell, valence shell, because that's those valence electrons are the ones that we care about. Okay. Now, this atom that you're looking at here, if you'll remember, the magic number that atoms, and I'm using this term want in quotations, they don't really want anything, they're not thinking, but in order to be more stable, atoms want to have eight electrons, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight in their outer shell most of the time. This inner shell is different. This inner shell can only accommodate two electrons, but the rest of them usually tend to accommodate eight. And so we're the rule of octet, atoms are looking to have a full outer shell. Now, because this atom here does have a full outer, sh outer shell, it's very happy and it is quite stable. This is one of the, would be a noble gas, perhaps, uh, and, and that means it is inert. It doesn't react very easily because it's happy the way it is, so it wouldn't react very much. These atoms aren't very involved in biological chemical reactions because they don't react with very much, okay? So, remember... Um, we just said all of that, that the behavior in an atom depends on the electrons in its outer shell. So the magic number is eight. We are looking for eight electrons in the outer shell. Okay? So this atom over here has one, two, three, four, five, six, six valence electrons. Okay? It's only two away from having that full eight in its outer shell, so it's pretty close. So it would really like to gain a couple of more here and here to make it think it had a full outer shell. This one over here has only these two in the outer shell. So I, I tend to think of these as like mosquitoes buzzing around its head and it would really just rather get rid of them and that way it would have a full outer shell uh, facing the outside world and that would ha satisfy that rule of octet. So this is a match made in heaven right here. This has two and wants to get rid of. This would love to have two. And so they might engage in a chemical bond to solve uh, their problem. So that wants to gain, okay, because it's so close to filling. This atom behaves a little bit differently because it wants to lose electrons because if it would lose those two, uh, the, the full shell would remain and it would be its outer shell, okay? So, if we think about the periodic table and how it's set up, it can be helpful to us uh, in anticipating how certain elements will behave, and it all has to do with how many electrons in their valence shells. No matter how many electrons and protons and whatever atoms have total, it's that outer shell uh, that determines their actual behavior in real life. So atoms that have the same numbers just in that outer shell will tend to behave similarly. Um, now, going across this way, okay, um, these atoms have the same number of shells, but not necessarily the same number of atoms in each outer shell, in the outer shell. So that's not terribly useful in, in biology.
okay, that information. What is useful is the elements that are in the same column. Those that are in the same column, like maybe for example these, these all have full shells, outer valence shells. Helium can only hold two in its outer shell, so it's full. These guys are full neon and argon. These are those inert noble gases. They all act basically the same way. Um, so this information is kind of useful to us in biology because we know that these things are not going to be very reactive, whereas these things that are just a couple of atoms or one atom away from being full are highly reactive and they're reactive in similar ways. This column, fluorine and chlorine behave very similarly in chemical reactions as do oxygen and sulfur behave very similarly. Okay, uh, So uh, that's just something to think about and this is not trivial. Okay, um, The only other um, atom other than oxygen that is used in um, as being f a foundational part of food chains and we'll talk more about this when we talk about photosynthesis but the oxygen in water is very very important in photosynthesis well there is a similar reaction in chemosynthetic organisms at the bottom of the ocean but they don't use oxygen instead they use sulfur but otherwise their chemosynthetic reactions are very similar to photosynthesis it's just of course the sun's not involved and instead of the oxygen in water that is being used, they're using sulfur instead. We'll talk more about this. The bottom line is these things act very, very similarly. Okay? So, um, that, we'll talk more about that later. That's what I just was trying to explain to you about chemosynthetic organisms. Alright, so chemical reactivity. Um, atoms tend to want to complete a valence shell that is almost full or they want an empty one that is um, not very full at all. Okay, so in this case this sodium atom, okay, sodium Na, uh, has one valence electron. If you'll remember its uh, atomic number is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Its atomic number is 11, which means it's going to be left with this one hanging out all by itself. Chlorine's atomic number is 17, which means it's going to have 17 electrons, and oh, it's going to be just one away from being full. This one has a mosquito, sodium has a mosquito buzzing around its head, and it wants to get rid of it. This one has like a little kid with a hole where they've lost a tooth. They would love to fill that hole in. They're a match made in heaven. In this situation, the pull of the chlorine is so strong uh, for this, and this is so eager to give it up, that the chlorine will actually outright steal, take, completely away that electron and leave the sodium with a positive charge because what have we done? We have taken away a negative charge, an electron, so now this thing has one more proton. Remember electrons and protons must balance each other out. Protons are positive, electrons are negative. If the atom is to be neutral, they're equal in number. So we're taking away a negative which means it's going to have one more positive so it's a charge of plus one on that sodium once its electron is stolen. Over here we've got this chlorine that has just taken that electron from sodium. It's got one more electron that it has protons so it's going to have a charge of negative one. These two opposing charges attract each other and these two atoms are held together by nothing more than opposite electrical charge at that point. If you'll recall, oh, I must have hit my button. Hold on. If you will recall, that um, is called an ionic bond because what you have just made when you steal an electron and 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 create a positively charged. Uh, atom is actually an ion and this is an ion too. It's got an extra negative charge. A charged particle is an ion. The two ions cling together due to their opposite electrical 
charges and that's what's holding them together and ionic bonds are reasonably easy to break that opposite electrical charge is pretty easy to disrupt especially in an aqueous or water-based solution so there's all kinds of bonds in biology there's weak ones and there's strong ones hydrogen bonds we will talk about those much later I'm gonna not even get into that right now though we're showing you little pictures of them van der Waals forces are also very weak but they are not trivial they do uh, these are extremely weak bonds due to a variety of things that um, uh, atoms engage in and I won't I don't understand it very fully myself but I do know they're weak but I also do know they can be important in determining molecular shapes uh, when you get a lot of uh, atoms together making a large molecule ionic bonds we just talked about they're weak they can be easily disrupted okay uh, by water and then those strong bonds and basically what's in the strong bond category for us are covalent bonds and in biology when in doubt when in doubt say it's a covalent bond because nine times out of ten you'll be right okay um, this is an example of a covalent bond hydrogen gas H2 okay and what's happening here is that these two atoms are sharing electrons okay covalent bonds share electrons between atoms okay two atoms will share a pair of electrons in an effort so to speak to um, make them think that they have full outer shells when neither of them really does but because they're sharing both of them sort of do okay both atoms hold on to their electrons and simply share them with each other these bonds are extremely stable and what we get when we have atoms sharing um, electrons is we say we have an actual molecule molecules are um, uh, creations that are formed when covalent bonds form okay so there's a hydrogen molecule okay there's your covalent bond and it's always represented by a line like this or almost always between two atoms uh, here's some more covalent bonds this time between oxygen and uh, hydrogen to create water okay and there again there's your nice symbol right there and hydrogen has one electron to go with its one proton in its nucleus and so does this one and oxygen needs two uh, electrons to make it think its outer shell is full this one only needs one so everybody's happy they think each hydrogen thinks it has two and the oxygen thinks it has eight in its outer shell so they are happy and it's a very stable compound at the end of this I would ask you to uh, go ahead and watch in the playlist this little YouTube video it will compare for you ionic and covalent bonds okay uh, the last thing I think I'm going to talk about in this little segment is just that you can have more than one covalent bond being shared between molecules there can be double covalent bonds where two pairs of electrons are shared you can have triple covalent bonds in which three pairs of electrons are share, shared and when you do these are extremely strong bonds the more electron pairs are being shared the stronger the bonds okay uh, so more is stronger so um, this is just one pair of electrons being shared but let me make sure yeah this is two pairs of electrons being shared there and that's going to be extremely uh, strong okay um, so double triple covalent bonds um, would all be stronger than a single all right there are two major types of covalent bonds polar and nonpolar and what the heck does it mean to be polar or nonpolar and that's where the next half of this little uh, intro to biochemistry is going to go and we're going to talk about water quite a bit that's it for right now I will see you in the next podcast